We're worshiping this morning, Jesus. My King, except for on, His this heart singing. This moment is important. When we draw near to Him, He draws near to us. This moment, that's why worship is important. Lord, we need you. We seek you this morning. We worship you. We magnify your name this morning, Jesus. Come on, you have to do that. We can do it corporately, man, but listen, we got to do it individually. Listen, somebody in this room this morning may be wanting to worship, but they may be waiting on to see somebody else to worship, but they may not get their freedom unless you worship this morning. That's why worship is important. We worship you, Jesus. That's why we're here. And that's what we're remain to do this morning. But we worship in this place, Father. Oh, we praise you this morning. Lord, I thank you for this time together with you this morning, Father. I thank you, Father, for my friends, Lord, this family here that I've been assembly of God. I get to come together every week, and I get to worship with my family every week. And God, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives as individuals, what you're doing in our lives as a ministry, what you're doing in the life of your church. And God, we are grateful to be a part of that this morning, to be a part of your overall church, that we get to represent you. And Lord, we get to magnify you. We get to make you known to this world. Thank you where you've put us, God. Thank you that you put us together, Lord, and that you designed, and you're in the middle of the designing this, God, and you're right in the middle of it. Thank you for that. Can you thank you for that this morning, church? Thank you. God, we're blessed. God, help us see it. God, help us understand it this morning. Help us know it. Father, I ask you to speak through me this morning. Use the words. Use the scriptures, Lord. Use the thoughts. Use the dreams. Use the things that you've put in my heart. And, Lord, that you put in, Lord, and in my life, God. And, and, and But especially that you put in your word this morning. God, I pray help, help, help us hear you this morning. Not just hear a, a man with a microphone and a voice, but hear you this morning. And we love you and we thank you. And everybody said this morning, amen. Give Jesus Christ a big round of applause. Hand clap. Sit down. Thank you, worship team. Thank you all for filling up the sides of the church, right? In the middle section, we kind of got to work on, right? The hurricane is not supposed to be here, storm later into the week, okay? I hope that's not why they're not here this morning, but uh, getting supplies and stuff like that. But uh, anyway, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Amy. I knew I was going to get you, Amy. Yes. Everybody needs Amy in their life, an, an Amy in their life. Just one, though. <laughs> one and a half, yeah. Listen, I'm uh, excited to speak, be able to speak to you this morning uh, and share what God's put on my heart this morning. Um, you know, we sang that song, I was thinking <laughs> this morning, we sang that song, Better Is One Day. That's a that's an older song, and I, I love that song. I didn't, I didn't know she was singing it this morning, although I'm married to her. So uh, um, I, I had no idea she was singing it. And um, you know what? Sometimes we say, uh, you know, I, I, better is better is one day at the house than in the presence of God. Is that right? There's people at home right now, for whatever reasons. Better is we love to go on vacation. Better is better is one day on vacation. Nothing wrong with these things. Nothing wrong with staying home and, and going on vacation. But if it's a pattern in their life. Better, better is a football game than, than God's presence, right? Woo. And listen, I'm a football fan, so I'm stepping on my own toes, okay? All right, so, and listen, again, I'm not trying to, I'm just saying, when I, when I was listening to that song, it just made me think, man, it made me reflect, maybe it just take me back to what's important, okay? Enjoy those things in your life, but man, I, l- l- coming into the house of God, worshiping together with your church family should be the pattern of your life, Right? Right? It should be, it should be what, what you look forward to and what you come, listen, every Sunday and every Wednesday, whenever we, we you know, it just come together and we, we get to do this, right? We get to be together, right? And that's pretty special, right? There was a time not too long ago we couldn't come together and it was miserable. Listen, don't forget about that, right? That's why we got to take advantage of moments like this, right? Thank you for being here this morning, okay? All right, so the title of my message this morning is A New Way of Living. And um, everybody say a new way. All right, 
So um, before I go into this, I'm going to give you some stuff I just read this morning, okay? And, and I, I'm, I'm reading, speaking mainly out of the book of Romans this morning. We've been going through that for, book of Romans with our youth, and, and I've been going through it personally also. And, but um, back, in, back in those times, it was very, very expensive to send letters, okay? And we have approximately 14,000 letters that archaeologists have found over the years uh, from letters that were written back during the New Testament times. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and 20, uh, on average, uh, a letter was either 20, 20 to 200 words, okay? Are you with me? And listen, Paul's average was about 1,300 words in his letters. He was a long-winded preacher. Okay, all right, or letter writer, okay, all right, but in Romans, anybody want to guess how many words it is? 7,000 words, 7,000 words, which is the longest, it is the longest letter that's been found. From That's pretty cool, right? And it's, he had a lot to say. He said a lot. And, uh, and this morning, we're just going to pull out a few pieces of it this morning, okay? We obviously can't go through all of it, but as you know, man, we're living I call it the crazy evil world, okay? I say that to our students all the time. They're like, we live in a crazy evil world? Because sometimes teenagers, you remember being a teenager, you didn't necessarily know what was going on around in the world. Now, nowadays, some of, most, a lot of them do because they have it right in front of them all the time. They have, you know, the, the apps and, and social media and all that. So they know what's going on in the world. They're kind of seeing it. But, you know, we're in the middle of a spiritual battle, and it's easy for us to live out of our own, everybody say my own, strength and wisdom, okay, and uh, and even my own power, all right, because we can get good at this. We can get good at this walking with, you know, being a Christian and, and going through the ritual things, but, but we need to understand and maybe remember who lives within us and what he is capable of doing for us and through us, okay? We got to understand. That's what I want to hit this morning. We need to understand and remember who lives within us, Okay? You, you didn't just get saved years ago or, or, or recently, and just and, and you, your job is to just wait until the ship comes and we go to heaven. Okay, that's not that's not the way this works. Okay, as a matter of fact, when you get saved, man, the love of God, the hunger and thirst for God should increase in your life. It should increase in my life, right? And listen, are you ever amazed? I sit around and think about this when I, you know, I was praying yesterday, and I was just, are you ever amazed? And, and listen, maybe even frightened like me at times that. Me and you are the vessel that uh, that change will flow through. Yes. Think about that. Me and you, the world we live. Why are we alive right now in this world that we live? Me and you are the, are the vessel. That we're the vessels that change. That the Holy Spirit is going to flow through to bring change. Can I, can I just tell you that's not just Pastor Dan because he's the pastor, and me because I'm a youth pastor. That's us as believers, right? Followers of Jesus Christ, and that's that's pretty heavy. Okay, that's why your life is so much more important than just your job and your family and your kids and, 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 and Wakulla County and, and the things you're involved in. Your, your, life, your life really matters and it stands in the balance with, uh, for other people's lives that need to know Christ. Right? It's a big deal. And, and, and that's why mornings like this is important. That's why our church family is important. Okay, there's church families all around Wakulla meeting this morning. That's why they're important this morning. All around the world meeting this morning, okay? But I'm glad I'm a part of this one, right? And I hope you are too. And um, today, I'm brief, uh, speak briefly in Romans, okay? And uh, we're going through the Romans road with our, with our student ministries right now. And um, you know what? Uh, and Paul is writing this letter to Jewish and, and Gentile Christians in Rome, okay? All right? I mean, pretty much to all believers in Rome, but, but those kind of make up the majority, Okay? And in a nutshell, he's declaring in this letter that, that about, you know, that all can have salvation, okay? That it's not just for the Jews who follow the law, okay? All right, I, I, listen, again, go read the book of Romans with us this morning, okay? I don't have time to dive into and dissect all the stuff about the law and all that this morning, okay? All right? But, but there was two sides. There was Jews and Gentiles that he was speaking to, Okay? And he's declaring his letter that all can have salvation. And this is very important. It was, it's very important for the Jews to know, listen, that they were not saved by, by obeying their Jewish law. What was circumcision, eating certain types of food, sacrifices, uh, religious you know, rituals they went through. And listen, but they're saved only through faith in Jesus Christ, okay? And I know you know that and I know that, okay? 
But, you know, I, I read this, I read it many times, but I was sitting there reading it, you know, this past week. I was like, man, what, what does that mean to me right now? What is that? I, I'm not a Jew, okay? I, I guess I'm a Gentile, but listen, I'm, a, I'm an American living in America right now. You understand what I'm saying? So what does that mean to me, okay? And I'm going to tell you, kind of tell you today what it, what kind of God pulled it out of my heart this morning. I want to give it to you this morning, okay? It was a conflict because the Jews were very religious when following the old Mosaic law, and there's nothing wrong with that, okay? They were devoted, and I mean, that's a good thing, but when Jesus, Jesus, when he came on the picture, he changed, that all changed. Okay, all the stuff of observing the law, following the law, and doing this to be saved, uh, that, that, grace came when Jesus came, when he died on the cross, and, and, and grace is what we live by now. He's trying to get them to understand that, okay? So Romans 3, 20 through 24, he says, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. He says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone and, and, and who believes, this is true for everyone who believes who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins, okay? I mean, that's the foundation of our faith right there, right there okay? All right? Here's the key scriptures. I want to slip ahead to Romans chapter 7, okay? He's just talking to, to these same people. He says, so my dear brothers and sisters, this is Romans 7, 4 through 6. He says, so my dear brothers and sisters, he says, this is the point. He says, you died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. All right? And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. I'm going to start right there and say, this ain't about deeds and earning our way to heaven anymore. This is about our faith. When, 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 we, when we enter into a relationship with Christ, we start walking out our faith, there's evidence of it. There's evidence of that faith, right? It says, when we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us. And the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds, resulting in death. But now we have been raised from the law. For we, are die, excuse me, for we die to it and are no longer captive, are captive to its power. Now we can serve God. Listen to this part. Now we can serve God. Not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in a new way of living in the spirit. Everybody say new way of living. And not just living how you want to live and how, but living in the, everybody say in the spirit. Okay, it's in the word of God right there. So what does all this mean for us today? I'm not saying all of us that are here today or, and even include myself, or we're not inviting the Holy Spirit in our lives and he's not, you know, he's not welcome. He is. And we're not being, you know, that we're not even being used by him today. But what I am saying is, if we're not careful, we can live our lives following religion and performing, listen, religious rituals instead of living in lives of surrender and with the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through our lives. Me and you can become and live by the law of religion also, if we're not careful. And that's where I found myself at times, and I don't know, if there may be somebody in this room, that's why I'm sharing with you this morning, okay? That, that's where, when we're living by a law of, of religion, then, then, then we're not having any kind of effect on this world that, and doing anything for the kingdom of God. All right, and I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning, but I ask you to take this person and say, and, and examine your heart this morning and say, is that me sometimes? Listen, there's nothing wrong with reading your word of God. You're supposed to. Nothing wrong with, with pray, prayer. You, we, God, we need it more than now than ever. Nothing wrong with worship and, and, and spending time in the presence of God with believers in, in a setting like this. Um, but it, it, can't, it can't be, that, that can't be what saves us. There's more, there's more to it than that. Um, Savior and Lord. We all want saving, right? Here's where some of us, if we're not careful, can be. Listen, we, we can be out in the water. And we can be drowning, and, and, and the boat comes up, and they throw a life ring out, and we get saved, and we get in the boat. But here's where some of us start, what we start doing if we're not careful. We, we don't want to just get saved. We, we, want, we, want to, we want to keep, we want to start driving the boat. Right? I mean, you slide over it. I mean, you saved me, but let me, uh, thank you, but let me, 
let, let, let me go and do my own thing. <laughs> right? Um, but do we, do we all want the Lordship part in our lives? And if we went around and polled everybody in the room this morning, we would say yes. But our actions and our faith really answer that question this morning. The Lordship happens when we yield to the Holy Spirit. The Lordship part happens, okay? The Savior part is, is, is a moment, listen, where, where you surrender your life to the Lord, and hopefully you, you, you've taken water baptism, and, that, and that, that shows the display of you giving, laying down your life, and you're picking up the life, that, uh, and you're living for Jesus of the change that took place in you, okay? But the Lordship part is us yielding. Everybody say yield. Yes. Yielding to the Holy Spirit, okay? We don't, we, when we yield to something, what do we do? We wait, all right, we, we're supposed to, okay? So I've seen some of y'all in a roundabout, okay? All right, some of y'all don't yield, okay? You just, you, you close your eyes, you hit the gas pedal, and you go, okay? And whatever happens, happens, okay? That's the way, that's way some of us are spiritually also, right? When we yield to something, we are to, we are to let you come. Pass by us and then lead us. You understand what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's where we're supposed to be. And the Lordship part happens when we yield to the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's super important. You know, we, we were given Ephesians, Paul says, it tells them we were given a deposit of the Holy Spirit. All of us have that this morning. Uh, um, if, if you're a believer in the room this morning and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, when you, when you got, the moment you got saved in that time, whatever that was, that, that, that when you entered into a relationship with Christ, he put a deposit, a deposit of, his, of the Holy Spirit into your life. Okay? And listen to what it says in Romans 8, 5, and 11, okay? I like, I, I, I want you to read this, okay? Listen to this, because he, he talks a lot about the Holy Spirit right here and what we're talking about today. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Can I just tell you, you still have your sinful nature, so don't just read this and say, that's not me anymore. <laughs> All right? We still have our sinful nature. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, everybody say Holy Spirit, Think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. That's why we can't play around with sin. You hear me? So letting your, let me, wrong, wrong one. But letting the Spirit, everybody say Holy Spirit. Control your mind leads to the life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. All right? Christians, believers, you are controlled by, everybody say Holy Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living in you, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. That's important. All right? We got it. He puts a deposit, and then we got we to gotta follow the Holy Spirit, right? Yield, that yielding part. And Christ lives within you, so even though your body would die because of sin, this body would decay, listen, the Spirit gives you life. When we get saved, what is saved? Our spirit, okay? This, the Holy Spirit gives you life. Listen, because you have been made right with God. The, whole, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Listen, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to, to, to our mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. All right, Romans 8, 14. Let me go right, it's simple, but read it. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. Who are the children of God? People who do their own thing, people that, that, uh, that said a prayer years ago and never walked out their salvation. People that are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. There is a leading and following that has to take place. Right? There's not a stagnant place you stay. You don't stay comfortable. Listen, you, we start walking in fellowship and, and, and under the guidance and the leadership of who? Of Holy Spirit. Um, listen to Paul's message. You heard it. He spoke about Jesus, but he, he spoke about a lot about Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was invited into his life. And listen, Paul leaned in and he leaned on the Holy Spirit. 
All right, it was a, he, that, that, that's, that's where his help come from. That's where his power come from. That's why he was able to live the life he lived and able to go to places he go and, and deal with the, the pain and the conflict and, the, and all the stuff that he had to go through because, because of, just because he was a normal man. Yes, he's a normal man, but he was led by the Holy Spirit. This, it, wasn't just, it wasn't just someone who fellowship, it wasn't just somebody who, who he fellowshiped with at youth camp a long time ago. All right? It wasn't just somebody who, 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 who he met at an altar in a, in, a, in, a, in a revival service at one time in his life. It was somebody who, who he met and he engaged in and it was a part of it. He, it. The Holy Spirit was a part of his life for the rest of his life. Is the Holy Spirit in our language? This, I've met people that never mention the Holy Spirit because they're, what they've seen and what they've heard about the Holy Spirit. They just, they just mentioned Jesus. This, that might be some of us in the room, okay? Is, 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 is the Holy Spirit, is he just an experience at the front of the church for all to see? It, it, it can be. That's where I was still at an altar in the front of the church by myself sitting at the altar praying one time in my life where it all began after salvation. All right? Listen, that can be, but that, that, it, it, it's got to leave from there. It's got to go, go from there. Um, is he someone, is Holy Spirit, I'm asking some difficult questions, I know, is, someone, is he someone who even makes you nervous or uncomfortable at times? I know this may be blaspheming for some of us, but that was me. Can I tell you that was me years ago? Because I, I, some of us didn't grow up in Pentecost. We didn't grow up around the Holy Spirit. We didn't, you know, we didn't, we didn't talk about it a whole lot. And we looked at churches and Pentecostal churches and charismatic churches like they, like there was something wrong with them, man. But you know, and I, and I, I did, I, I experienced the power of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in my own life. But, but I didn't just experience. I read about it, and I saw the evidence of it. And, and you know what? And, I don't, and I'm not trying to knock what you've seen or heard what's happening in your life, but I'm saying this morning, don't, don't kick him to the curb because of something that's, that, you, that you may have, have, have felt uncomfortable with. Right? Um, maybe, maybe due to some teachings you've heard, maybe you believe that he's just for those, those early Christians and believers in Acts. Listen, I'm not here to debate that this morning. I'm, but I, what I'm here to say this morning is I would present to you this morning that he is the most important person in your life right now if you're a Christian. Holy Spirit is the most important person in your life right now. More than your wife, your, your, your husband, your, your kids, more than, more, more than anything in your life right now. The Holy Spirit is the most important person in your life right now if you're a believer this morning. Sometimes we treat the Holy Spirit like he's like the misfit of the Trinity. And, and we, we equate him with craziness, and we equate him with, with, with loudness and emotions. And some, a lot of that's real, though. Yeah. All right, we can't just kick out emotions out of church but, but have emotions in our everyday life and say, well, we, it can't happen in here. Yeah. Right? I mean, when things happen and change happens, somebody walks in here this morning and, and says, look, I, I got $10 million for every single one of you, and I really have it. Here it is. And gives it to you. Guess what? You're going to get emotional. I mean, I'm just, I know that's a crazy analogy this morning, but you will get emotional. Can I just tell you this morning, don't, don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Because he is the person right now that's, that's walking with you daily and guiding you and leading you and giving you the help that you need right now in this life that you live right now on the face of this earth. And listen, and if, and if you're doing things and, and if stuff happens and it gets emotional, sometimes people do crazy things in their emotions. It's okay. Okay? All right? Just, it, just deal with it like you deal with it at work when you deal with people that get emotional and stuff. All right? Don't deal with it any, any different than we deal with it in the church. But sometimes we like, we're afraid of something because of, and I just want to try to clear your mind of that today and try to clear your thoughts of that today. I know that's kind of on a soapbox thing, but the Holy Spirit isn't a misfit in the Trinity. He's the most important in your life, most important person. Everybody say person in your life right now. Listen, if you're not a believer or a Christian in this house this morning, Jesus 
is the most important person in your life. You hear me? Listen, the answer, he's the answer for you this morning. All right? Even Jesus, even Jesus, what happened to him when he got baptized? Matthew 3, 16, after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were open, and he saw, what did he see? What did he need? He saw the Spirit of God descending like him, like a dove and settling on him. Man, if Jesus needs it, then I need it, right? All right, and I know there's people in this room this morning like, well, what, what are we talking about? People I mean, treat the Holy Spirit like he's dead. Can I just tell you it happens? You know what? And I don't, I don't want, I don't know if there's anybody in this room like that this morning, but I want you to feel comfortable with the Holy Spirit. Because I fought and wrestled with this all my life because I didn't, wasn't raised in this. You know what? And, and I, but I've seen, I've seen the power and I've seen the Holy Spirit work in my own life. I've seen the evidence. Listen, I, I, I've, I've seen what he can do and what he can do in me and through me. And you know what? It, it only happens because of my faith and because of your faith, okay? And, and sometimes to believe the things what the Holy Spirit has for you, listen to me, sometimes, you know, we, we, we hear it and we, we say we want it, but there has to be a faith step to receive it and to use it, right? And sometimes it's not a step. Sometimes it's a leap. Sometimes it's a jump. Right? I mean, faith sometimes requires not understanding, not comprehending, not having all the details, but, but just taking a jump and letting God catch you, letting the Holy Spirit catch you. So I want to ask this question this morning. Was Jesus enough? I asked that to our students a while back. Was Jesus enough? It's a trick question. Absolutely, Jesus was enough. Okay, before you throw rocks at me, okay? All right? <laughs> That's a true question. Of course, Jesus, he's enough for our salvation. He's enough for our freedom from sin. He's enough. He's, he was enough to allow access into the kingdom of God. Us to the, we have access to God's kingdom. We don't just have earthly access. Right? That's boring. Right? He gave us access to God's kingdom. He was enough. Listen, what he accomplished on this earth in his life, his death, and his resurrection, man, was simply enough. Okay? And listen, he is the, he is the foundation. He's the foundation from which our faith has been on Jesus is. Right? Chief Cornerstone talks about it in Acts 4.11. Man, he's the foundation. But here's the thing this morning I want you to hear. It doesn't stop there. The story didn't just stop with Jesus and end with Jesus. Okay? All right, there's, there's a whole rest of the New Testament that, that talks about the, the Holy Spirit. It talks about how the Holy Spirit worked in believers' lives and how the kingdom of God was built because that's how the kingdom of God is built. Listen, through our faith in Jesus Christ and through the power and the working of the Holy Spirit through our lives. That's the way it works. The disciples, they had followed Jesus for three years. I'm going to go through this pretty, pretty fast, okay, because i got a few more pages, okay? All right, listen. He had told them what was going to happen to him after his death. In John 16, 7, he says this. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. You've heard the scripture before. He says, because if I don't, the advocate, the comforter, the encourager, the counselor, he's not going to come. Okay? He said, but if I go away, he says, then I'm going to send him to you. And that's a good thing. You hear me? When Jesus sends something to you, can I just tell you it's a good thing? I don't care what your thoughts about it and what your what, what your what, what the lies you've seen or, or, or the the stuff that you that you've seen about it. When Jesus sends something to, something to you like the Holy Spirit, we grab a hold of it, man. It needs to be become part of our life. Jesus had prepared his disciples and told them about his death, but they were not mentally or emotionally prepared to face it. All right, their Messiah was crucified. He died right in front of them. Their friends took his body down from the cross and they buried him in a tomb. They were hopeless. Nothing made sense. The disciples hid away, afraid for their own lives because they were in danger. And they were in danger. And their lives were at risk and they did get their lives eventually for it. Some of us are there today. We're hopeless. Nothing makes sense. We're, we're hiding and fear has a grip on us. The answer is the Holy Spirit. That little line we sang about is right. What's that? What was the verse? The lion rises. Well, uh, I'm, I'm horrible with words, songs. You got a line inside of your uh, lungs. I was going to sing it, but y'all were leaf. Okay, all right. You've got a lion inside of your. You know, you know who that lion is? The Holy Spirit. Here, I know Jesus represents the lion, but man, Jesus is not physically in me right now. The Holy Spirit is. All right, everybody got me? It went deeper than I thought it was going to. But anyway, here we go. Here's what happened next. Jesus rose. His dead body came back to life, and they saw him resurrected. 
After Jesus' death, he appears. That's worth celebrating. He appears to his disciples. In Acts 1-3, he says, During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. He gave them their mission. All right. Take the message of his resurrection to the whole planet, what he told them. Every person was to hear about what had happened and was also invited into a personal relationship with God. Listen, and, and listen, they, they weren't formally educated. All right, here's the good thing, because we relate to these people, all right? If you're formally educated, I didn't mean that as an insult, okay? But some of us aren't, okay? All right, all right. Listen, they weren't, they weren't formally educated. They were young. They lived in a poor region under Roman rule. The 12 had gotten along very well, and they battled, hadn't gotten along very well. They had battled each other for the top position in their group. None of them had, tw- had traveled more than 200 miles from home, and all this took place in an era of limited technology. It seemed like an impossible mission, right? Look at the world we live in today. All right, just think about, think, you know, I, I, think, I don't try to think about a whole lot, but you can't help but think about it. Our mission today, and I'm a youth pastor, so my mission today, when I look at youth ministry, I look at what they're going through and what they're facing and the things they have in front of them and distractions, it looks impossible. Does it not? Can we be honest? Um, it's not impossible, though. The big problem was Jesus wanted them to do this without him, and they didn't quite understand that. All right? And 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 when I say he he wanted them to do this without him, I mean physically him. All right? The disciples were afraid to go forward without Jesus. And listen to this this morning. Some of us today have salvation. We believe in Jesus. But some of us in this morning, in in, in the sound of my voice this morning, we've stopped walking and living in the power made available through the life and the death of Jesus. We start with Jesus. We've received the deposit. Amen. And and I'm just telling you that, that you're, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, you have a deposit of the Holy Spirit. You're Christians more. You're going to heaven, but we need more than that. We desperately need more than that. Yes. Not for a great church service and for us to, but for, but for, for people, for, for people's lives to be changed, for my family's lives to be changed, your grandkids before. So, 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 I, I, you know, this is about change. Um, what we have in our lives without the power of the Holy Spirit is simply not enough. Yes. Hear me, it's just not enough. And I need you to understand that this morning. I need you to hear that this morning. I need you to hear the Holy Spirit speak that to you this morning. That, that listen, Jesus was enough and what he did was enough, but man, there's more. So what's next? Let's talk about the more. He, he told them on the occasion when he was appearing to them what was next. Acts 1, 4, and 5. He says, once he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Yes. That's what's next. That's what's available to you and I today. It didn't just happen in Acts a long time ago for those people. Those people are us today. Um, so I want to ask you a big question today. Are you willing to admit that you need help? Uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. Are we willing, are we willing to, to admit that we need help? Inadequies don't, an, an adic, I said it right the first time. That don't, that don't surprise God, inadequacies. It doesn't shake his confidence in us. It doesn't limit what he can do in and through us, Okay. All right, in fact, becoming aware of our own personal inadequacy must happen before God can do powerful things in our lives and through our lives. Jesus taught this on the Sermon on the Mount. First thing he taught, he got all these people together, greatest sermon in, in, in the scriptures. What's the first thing he says? He says, blessed, in Matthew 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And another way to put that, I've read it, I love it. Blessed is the person who realizes they are completely destitute, utterly hopeless, one who realizes their absolute need for God. It's not on the screen, but paraphrase this. Nothing changes. Nothing changes in my life or through my life until I'm willing to admit that I need help. We need help. 
you ever feel like you're losing as a Christian sometimes? I feel like I, I feel like I'm going to heaven one day, but I don't I don't want my my my, grand, my, my grandkids one. I don't want my son to walk. With the, you know what? I, I, I what and what's the answer? The answer the answer is Holy Spirit. And I, I used to say, to, you know, we but the, the answer is Him flowing and working through our lives. Salvation was the beginning of your relationship. Following of, of beginning, beginning of, of you following Jesus, and we're living this life out with the power and the leadership and the guidance from the Holy Spirit. I mean, you must recognize our need for something more before God can do something amazing in us and through us. All right, you cannot ever, God can never do anything in and through your life until you come to the place where I surrender all. Love that song, right. I surrender. All right? Self-dependency is the enemy of a supernatural life. And supernatural means it's above and beyond what is naturally possible. It, it involves a, a accessing a power that is not within our natural selves. All right? Me and you, me and you are powerless. Listen, and, and, and we can't change anybody's life. We can't change any situation. But we have the person, a deposit of that person living on the inside of us. And we can have more of that also. It describes what happens when God gets involved with people who are willing to trust him. And to, to admit that I need help, you're saying, God, I trust you. Jesus, you, you said I can have this gift, and you said this gift is for me. And if Jesus, if you want to give me, again, I'm going to say it again. If you want to give me a gift, then it's a good gift. Right? We still have that commission from Jesus to continue to take it to the world. Listen, and I'm almost finished. The power of the Holy Spirit does this. He brings change. Yeah. Everybody say change. change. Peter was part of the inner circle, Jesus' discipleship group. There were 12 of them. You know this. And he spent most of the time with, or maybe you know this, with three of them. And they were Peter, James, and John. Okay? Peter tried to serve God in his own strength. All right? He proclaimed his loyalty to Jesus when Jesus predicted that he would be betrayed and all of, the, all of them would betray him. He said, even if I fall away, Jesus, I, Peter, never will. All right? He even said, I, I, even if I have to die with you. He said that to Jesus. If I, Peter said, if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you, Lord. <laughs> I mean, we laugh about it. Man, that was... He meant it in his heart, but he had no idea how weak he actually was and how strong his desire for self-preservation would be and how weak he was, right? Can, can I just ask you this? Do you know, I hope, you, hope we understand how weak we are without Holy Spirit. When the moment came, he denied knowing Jesus three times. He was inconsistent with his efforts, walking on water one moment, sinking in the waves the next. Come on, li listen to this. I know we're talking about Peter, but we're talking about me and you also. Hint, hint. Okay, all right. And I say me and you. I'm talking about me too. Walking on the water one moment, sinking in the waves the next. Making the confession that Jesus is the Son of God and rebuking Jesus to his face for considering the mission of dying on the cross the next moment. One moment standing boldly in the Garden of Gethsemane, the next moment calling curses down on himself because he denied Jesus. He fell miserably. After his third denial of Jesus, he even said to his little girl, he said to his little girl who recognized him, hey, little girl, leave me alone. I swear to you, I don't know who he is. He got pretty nasty with her. He hid in fear. He decided to leave ministry. He returned to fishing. It says that in John chapter 21, verse 3. His confidence was shaken, and when Jesus asked him, do you love me? Peter could hardly answer. Man, in John 21, 16, he could hardly even answer. <laughs> Having said all that, aren't you glad Peter didn't give up? Um, if you read John 21, you see that the grace is Jesus you know, gave Peter. He gave him a second chance. He gives him many chances. And listen, we all identify with Peter. All right, we all identify with Peter this morning. He represents most of us. Peter, look, grab a hold of this. Peter walked with Jesus. And I mean, I'm not just talking about Holy Spirit here. He walked with physical Jesus, person Jesus. He walked with him. And he still did stupid things. He still messed up. Right? Peter was there. Listen, and the fact is he just needed, he just needed more help. Are you with me this morning? He needed more help. Like me and you need more help this morning. I'm trying to get you to understand this morning. Listen, there's a new way of living, and we, and we, and we need help living it. We need help living his life. Um, 
Acts 2 shows the transformation of Peter. Peter was there waiting as Jesus told him. They were praying, and God began to give him the gift he had promised. He poured out himself, the Holy Spirit, on that day in the book of Acts. And I don't mind to read all of it to those 120 people that were there waiting. And listen, you know, and, and, he, and then he stood there. He stood there boldly, you know, to, that they, they prayed in, in other languages and other tongues, and, 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 and the wind blew. And, it, and, it, it was, and, and people are down, this, they're up on top of this terrace in this little, like, like, like a townhouse type thing, and the people, not a nice townhouse, but like a little stone-looking townhouse. Don't go with me there, okay? But, man, these people saw some stuff happening, and they started gathering around like, what is going on? The Holy Spirit fell, right? He stood there. Then he stood there. He received the Holy Spirit. He stood there declaring Jesus to several thousand people in the same city where Jesus was crucified. Speaking about a mile or two from where the crucifixion happened. He didn't go out in the woods and hide and do all this. He was right there in the middle of it. He was risking his life in this moment. Listen, and the difference was he had been filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, God could not have used him in Jerusalem like he, listen, if he hadn't been filled with the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness, forgiveness was crucial to Peter. It's crucial to me and you, right? Listen, but it wasn't enough, okay? That's good. We need it, but it's not enough. He needed restore, restoration, but that wasn't enough. Listen, he needed, he needed more, okay? He needed to be empowered, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. It is real, okay? It is real. Listen, our family, look at me this morning. I'm almost finished. Our family needs change. Tasha, you can go ahead and come on up. Worship team, you can go ahead and come on up. Our family needs change. Change needs to happen in our families. Listen, I know you may have the perfect family, but I'm just no living, raising kids in this, in this uh, environment and the world we live in is, 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 is daunting, okay? Uh, and I know I'm not trying to knock the world you live in and generations you grew up in, but I'm just saying it's, man, it's, it's just it's scary at times, okay? Our family needs change. Our marriages, all right? Listen, you can't, just, you can't just go on good looks forever, okay? I'm just going to tell you, your marriage, our marriage needs change sometimes. And God's going to change it, but how, how's he going to change it? He's not going to send some other person into your marriage. I hope not. I know he won't do that. How's he going to change it? He's going to change you, the husband or the wife, or both. Are you with me? Our work environment needs change. Our church, our ministries need changing. Our schools need change. Our community needs change. Our government needs change. Our world needs change, right? How, what, is, how, what, is, what brings change? Holy Spirit. What brings change? Holy Spirit. Jesus was enough for the miracle work and the miracle of salvation this morning. And if you're not saved this morning, he's enough for you. Jesus is enough for you this morning for salvation. That's a miracle in itself. That's the best miracle there ever was, there it will be. It's for a life, and for someone to give up their life. First of all, that was a miracle what Jesus did. But for us to see that and read that, and for us to give up our life and say, Lord, I, I want to follow you because you did that for me. All right, that's a miracle. Because we're born selfish and sinful. All of us, nasty hearts, filthy hearts. That's, that's all of us, everyone in this room. And our, and our, our inclination is to take care of me and, and to... But Lord says, and for us to give up that, to give up all our plans and our desires and our comforts of life and say, Lord, I want to follow you and be uncomfortable. Because it is uncomfortable being a Christian in, to, in today's world. If, if you're not, you, you, you're blending in. We're blending in. For those who believe in Jesus, that initial, initial moment when we surrender our lives to follow Jesus, you receive a deposit. We talked about that. But it's not the end of the work of the Holy Spirit. That's only the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's only the beginning. Maybe you were filled with the Holy Spirit years ago. Maybe you haven't been refilled, but may, listen, and I'm just telling you, there's access to as much of, of, of the, the help that Jesus said is ours as we want, as what we need, okay? It ain't just about wanting it for for our display. Listen, it, it, is, it is so that so that we can be, be Jesus' hands and feet to this world, his mouthpiece to this generation, this next generation, and to the people in this in this world of what color county that don't know Christ. There's a new way of living. I want you to watch this video. Listen. 
You can just kind of keep playing solidly. That's fine. Watch this video real fast. If you want. It, it's very short. The man on the left. In lane three, alongside the man on the left is blind. For international sprinter for the United States. This is the Paralympic Games. I ran with him our first practice. Coach immediately said, you're going to run with him after me. And, you know, the rest has been history. Work. Here you go. Drive, 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 drive. Stay in tight. Running with Jerome, I don't have to worry about going out too far. All I have to focus on is just listening to him. Get up. Nice. Arm action should be exact. We should be hitting the ground at the same time. This time, they're away. The crowd gets away very, very well in shape. Can you see his run? We're like one person. It should look like one person running. That's the thing. That tracking shot on camera is magic to watch because it just shows that they're running almost like one person. Some of us are living this life, man. I'm not saying you're not a Christian this morning, but some of us are living this life. And we, we've got access to that guy that was on the right that he was connected to. We had we got access to that. We have access to somebody who wants to lead us to the finish line. You hear me? He wants to lead us to the finish line. But we push him away like he's some foreign object we don't need in our life, or like he's something scary, or like he's something. Some of us are running or this life blindly and just hoping to make it one day. That's what that's where we're at without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's where we're at without the Holy Spirit. And again, you receive a deposit, but I'm just telling you, you know, whenever I start my bank account. I put a deposit in, but I I needed more since then. So I've had I've had to, I've had to get more. Are you with me this morning? Can you tell you there's more available this morning? There's more of the Holy Spirit. Whatever it looks like, sounds like, feels like. I, it, listen, throw away all that stuff that you're worried about this morning. And I, I encourage you this morning to receive what God has for you this morning. Some of you, your language, the change comes. Some of you, your language will change. Your prayer language will change. Do you hear me this morning? That happened in, the, in, in, in Acts. When it fell, it happened in five other instances. When they prayed for believers in the New Testament, when they went and prayed with them, they began to speak in other tongues. Listen, we're not going to coach you. We're not going to teach you. We're not going to yell at you or shake you or push you or anything to, this morning. Because it's simply a, a gift. It's simply, simply something you receive by asking and, it's, and then receiving it through faith. For some of you, it is a leap of faith. For some of you this morning, it's a step of faith. For some of you this morning, it, it is just a refilling. You've been there. But you know what? You try to run this race alone by yourself. And God is saying, stop doing that. It ain't good for you. It ain't good for your family. It ain't good for the lost people that, 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 you, that I'm trying to reach with your life. God is saying, listen to me this morning. Can I ask you this morning, can you stand to your feet? Can you admit that you need help this morning? And I want to invite you this morning to do something uncomfortable. Listen, if you say, just pass over, I want more, and I admit that I need help this morning. If that's you, without me begging you or without pleading, I'm not going to do all that this morning. I want to ask you to take a fast step. I want to ask you to come right here and just stand somewhere at this altar. If you want to kneel, that's fine also. If you want to stand, that's fine also. But if you want more and you want help this morning, you'll say, God, I, I admit, I need it. I need more than what I have right now this morning. Remember, it, it, your family may stand and bounce. I, I, I'm asking you this morning, to, uh, church. What do you need this morning? What does our world need? Me more, more of Jesus, but more of the Holy Spirit. Can I ask you this morning to recognize the need for it this morning? Come on. I've got one response.